So I have owned the Tereva Scrama for a little over three and a half years. I've used it extensively. I think I'm ready to give you a long-term use review. If you're interested, keep watching. So as I mentioned a minute ago, I have owned this knife for about three and a half years. In fact, it was March 2018 when I purchased this knife. I have a video which I'll link at the end of this one where I take this out into the woods for the very first time and th put it through its paces. But since that time, this has been my cutting tool of choice for wood processing whenever I go out in the woods. Yes, I have axes. Yes, I have hatchets. Yes, I have saws and I have uh, some other big knives as well but for the most part this is the one I grabbed first and what I want to do for you is tell you not only why this is the one I like to take with me but what it is I've learned about this knife uh, since then so let's just go back a little bit and talk about what this knife is all about I'm not going to go into a lengthy detail on the knife I will provide you the, the description the specifications for the knife but I want to focus in on what I've done with it and what I think about it so what does is this say? So this comes from Verustalika. This is the description. That is the company, of course, that sells the uh, Tereva Scrama. And this is what they have to say about it. The Scrama, as in Scrama Sax or Sax. A short, single-edged sword, popular in the Middle Ages. Much like the Scandinavian Luku, it doubles up as a tool and weapon. A fine name is always nice, and the best ones are those with some history behind them. Our 21st century Scrama would surely meet the demands of any Saxon man from ye good old days. Um, those of you who have shopped on Verustalika know the sense of humor they have. They're, they're great. They really are. Actually, they're, they're some really good people. And the service is second to none. I recently had something shipped from Verustalika to me. From the day the order was placed to the day it was in my hand was seven days. That's not bad, really, you know, for international shipping, especially coming into Canada, having to go through the borders and customs. So let's talk a little bit about the tool itself. I'll give you some specifications and then we'll go into some detail on my use. So the overall length of the Scrama is 430 millimeters or 16.9 inches, so just shy of 17 inches in length. It weighs in at 525 grams or 1.16 or 1 pound 16 ounces. That can't be right. One pound 16 ounces. I'll put the correction for that on the screen. Uh, it must be 1.8 pounds, but I will put the correction for that on the screen. Of course, that doesn't include the sheath. This is just the knife alone. The blade comes in at 240 millimeters, which is 9.4 inches. The width of the blade itself from top to bottom is 46 millimeters or 1.8 inches. The thickness of the blade is 4.2 millimeters, which is 0.2 inches. And of course, that's the thickness of the blade stock. Now, there are a few other things that we'll just go into, or I'll leave the details with you in the show notes below, but let's just talk about them quickly. To start with, this knife is made from a steel which has only recently arrived on the scene in North America, and that is 80 CRV2, and it is hard to harden to 59 on the Rockwell scale. Now, there is a lot more knives becoming uh, made with this steel for very good reason, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The f it has an well, let's talk about the features of the knife right now. So what is unique about the knife along its edge is that it is basically, uh, you might look at this and think it is a Scandinavian grind. I'm going to refer to it as a saber grind because while it does have a small primary bevel, it has a secondary bevel at the edge and that would make it in either in, you can call it a, a Scandi with a secondary bevel or you can call it a saber grind. I think either one would apply. But it has two edge geometries on the secondary bevel. The primary or the main cutting area from about this point to the tip comes in at 34 degrees, while from this point to the back edge, I'll have to look down at my notes, 
comes in at 25 degrees. So why did they do that? Why two different angles on this? And well, if you look at this knife, it you can tell right away it is a chopping knife. That's what it is all about. This is for chopping. So it has a fairly obtuse angle on the forward part of that to resist damage from being chopped into wood. Yet way back here, most people don't chop this far back. They use the forward portion of the blade. They made it at a much slighter angle and that makes it much slicier. So it's ideal for doing feather sticks or any fine carving that you feel that this edge is not quite up to the task. Uh, we'll talk more about my experience with that in a minute. It does have a sharpened spine, but it's unlike any spine on any other style of knife whatsoever. There is an angle. So don't think, well, I'll give you some close-ups, but there, instead of being straight up and 90 degrees, there is an angle to the edge of the spine, yet the very edge is sharp enough to use for scraping bark, uh, ferrocerium rod, for whatever else you want to use the back of your knife for scraping for. So I'll, again, I'll give you a few close-ups in a moment. It has a full length tang, but it is not an exposed tang. And what that means is there is a tang, it is hidden, it runs the full length, as you can see from the metal and the large ring on the end of the handle, but it is completely wrapped in a hard rubber material. So it makes it a full tang, just not a full broad tang. And it has all the strength that you would want of any full tang knife. Now the handle itself, as I mentioned, is covered in a hard rubber material that is both grippy yet very resistant. It's not pliable and soft at all. It has two cutting positions. The primary cutting position that most people will use at least for close-up chores is up front and I did show this in the original video but I'll come up and show you some close-ups in a second and then it has a secondary grip at the back of the knife. Now why the two grips? Well the secondary grip, the one to the back of the knife, allows you to use the full length of this tool for chopping. So you get much more momentum uh, with the knife than you would if you held it up closer to the guard. Yet at the same time, if you're looking to do some carving with this knife, then you can move your grip up and wrap around and you were right up and over top of that sharpened 25 degree beveled edge right there, giving you all kinds of control. All right, let's uh, give you a few close-ups and then we'll talk about my experiences with the knife. All right, let's uh, work our way down the knife. Now, people have asked, and there has been a lot of speculation on why there's a hole in the forward portion of the blade. People had thought maybe it had something to do with the heat treat. Maybe it needed to be straightened after heat treat. Not at all. Uh, Verustalika states this is simply for hanging it up. That's all it is. So if you have a little peg in the tree, a nail or a small branch, and you want to hang your knife up while it's out of the sheath, then you can do that by using this hole. I want to focus in on the tip of the knife to give you an idea just, just how stout that is. So there is maximum strength at the tip of this knife that uh, so much so that I have no concerns about it uh, breaking off at all. And we'll talk more about how I used it and came to that conclusion. I also wanted to show you the spine as best I can. Hopefully you can see if maybe I can come a little closer yet. And you see that there are two angles to the spine, yet that is still, it's not 90 degrees, but it is sharp. So if my finger was a ferrocerium rod being drawn across the back of the spine, it will throw sparks. Or if I'm scraping bark off a stick to bear, get down to bare wood, this works well for that. Let's move our way down to the edge. Now here you can see the finer carving angle, the 25 degree angle back here. And yes, I've resharpened it a few times, so it is not as pristine looking as it is when you get this new from the factory. But uh, again, we'll talk about sharpening it in a minute. Now, moving on to the grip itself. If you'll notice how the rubber grip extends up over the top of the spine. Now there's a real benefit to that. So when I get in close, the web of my hand between my forefinger and thumb, I can move that to a point where it's literally right over top of any work that I'm doing. So I get maximum control and able to exert maximum effort without having to worry about uh, losing control of the knife. Now, I know that in my original video, 
I had talked about, would this be comfortable with extended use? Would this small area, which comes in between the two fingers there and the center finger, would that start to irritate from extended use, cause hot spots? And the answer is no, it has not at all. And, uh, you know, my concerns were just unfounded there. In fact, it's extremely comfortable. Let's move our way down to the grip and you can see just a regular grip there with a kind of a bigger pommel and of course that aids with uh, holding on to the knife while you're swinging it. I have two lanyards on this and I'm going to reposition the camera so I can talk about those two lanyards. Okay, it took me a minute to reposition the camera. I'm working with the sun as it comes through the trees here. And I'm finding that uh, in the angle coming down that I'm either too dark or not too light, but most of the time too dark. So I think I've found a position for the camera now that's going to work. So I mentioned a minute ago the two lanyards. Why two lanyards? Well, to start with, I'm going to take the longer of the lanyards off and I'll put it back on in a second. Uh, there's just a little tiny orange one. What's that all about? Really? That's just in case I drop it in the snow to help me find it. It really has nothing functional at all. I could get my baby finger through it, maybe. No, that's not the reason I have it at all. It is literally just so that I can see it. If I uh, slam it into the uh, end of a log and be in all black, I can't see it quite easily. Uh, this just helps me find it. That's all it is for. And anything longer than that, I find on a cutting implement, be it a knife like this or an ax, gets in the way. I don't like having that swinging off of the end of the tool while I'm using it. But why the second lanyard? Let me put that back on and I will explain. So one of the nice things about this tool is that it has that large hole on the end of the knife, which allows you to slide a lanyard like this in and hook it on with a little lark's head. And uh, this, all it is is just a overhand knot, nothing special there on a piece of paracord. Why do I have that? I don't use this most of the time with chopping, but I did want to show it to you as an option and the ways I have used it. So one way of using it, if you want to make sure you're not going to lose your grip, is to put it on your thumb, roll the hand over, and now grab on, and I can get a little further back yet on the grip of the knife. So I can just maximize every bit of swing out of this without any fear of this slipping out of my hand or my hand traveling any further back on the grip than it already is. So that's the primary use. As I mentioned, I don't use that very often, but it is something you may want to consider. The other reason for it is this. I have used this knife up further on the blade. Now, I'm not going to call this a carving tool. I'm not going to call it a skinning or a hunting knife. You could press it into service for that without question, but look at that tip. It is fine enough that you can do some carving with it, cutting holes and that type of thing. And by doing this, by having this little bit of a lanyard around my forearm, I'm able to work with the tip of the knife with little fear of dropping this and having it go through my foot. So that's part of the reason for having that lanyard on it. Uh, there's something I want to say about this that most people don't think about when it comes to big knives. Um, if you watch my videos, you'll know that I like to carve spoons. I don't do it a lot. I don't consider myself professional or even very good at it. But there's something relaxing and rewarding about carving an implement that you can use yourself while out in the woods. And most people will use a hatchet, and a hatchet is the correct and primary tool that most people can use. But I learned some time ago that a knife like this can be almost as effective for carving a spoon. So if I'm out and I suddenly discover that I have left my spoon at home, and I have done that, I try not to do that anymore, but I have done that, then this will work and what makes it work is you not there's not much to show you here but you can see there's a bit of a belly a bit of a bow to the edge of this blade and what that allows is a bit of a slice in motion when you swing so what I discovered in working with a billet or a block of wood and shaping it into the primary shapes of a spoon and I'm not going to say I take this right down to a finished product but at least getting the primary shape like I might with an axe that I can do nice little chop cuts like this with a lot of control. Now here's the thing, I'm not using this tip out here. I'm using the middle portion of the blade because I am closer to it with my hand, no matter what position I'm in, I'm closer to it than I would be out here, which means that my, my chops can be more precise and go exactly where I want them to go. 
I'm still using the full weight of the blade, even though I'm not out here, I'm still using the full weight, even though it, it would appear to be using a much shorter knife. You're not, you're using the full length. You're just cutting where you have more control back here. So it has been great for cutting or for carving. Again, it's not the reason, not the first tool I would grab for carving, but it works very well for that. So what do you use a knife like this for? Chopping right? It is a chopper. Well, there's no question. Look at this thing. It is a chopper. Yes, I know that historically something like this could be used as a weapon or a game processor, and, and that's those uses are there. They're just not uses I'm likely to put them towards, but it is a chopping knife. So here again, a little admission. I don't do a lot of chopping with tools, uh, axes or uh, knives like this. Um, if I am going to be chopping wood, it's probably with an axe or a hatchet. I have chopped with this. I will chop with this in the future, but that's not what I use it primarily for. What do I use it for? Splitting. There, I cannot imagine a better knife available out there for splitting large pieces of wood. The combination of that length and stoutness and the small, or the Scandi or Sabre, whichever one you call it, grind on this, and the ability to get my hand well out of the way. Uh, I have no fear of chopping or batoning through anything that I can span. You know, maybe upwards of five inches, that's probably the maximum I would go, but to be honest, I usually don't even uh, baton that big three inches, four inches at the most. I've used this camping for three years in a row at Kujbaquak National Park when I go with my wife, Gina, and we purchase, because we're required to purchase wood there at the park. They use a kiln dried hardwood, a mix of uh, maple, primarily beech and oak, and probably some uh, uh, birch in there as well, but it is hard, hard wood, and it comes from large billets that have been split down. But yet, if I want to make it into kindling size, I've got to split it further. So usually I'll start with an axe. Yes, I will. I'll start with an axe until I get it down to a certain size where I can baton it. And then this comes out, and I just baton it, and I just wail on this knife. So yeah, that's probably something I should mention right now. This is not attractive in the sense of some of the very refined showpiece type knives that I have a few, but nothing, you know, really spectacular. This is a working knife. You know, for what I paid for this, this performs like a very expensive knife, but I don't mind bashing on this. In fact, I do bash on this on a regular basis without any fear of damage in it, without any fear of making it look ugly or marked up. In fact, the more ugly and marked up it gets, the better I like it. And we'll talk about some of the marks that are on this and where they came from in a moment. So if you look like or feel like you want it, you have a tool that you want to really bash on, but you've paid a lot of money for it, invest in one of these things and you'll, you'll just want to bash on this. This just invites being rough with. So has it caused any damage being rough with this knife? No. Now I will, I do know that there have been reports by some people of splitting the rubber and yes, that can happen. If you smash on the rubber with your baton, instead of hitting the blade out here, then you're likely going to split some of the rubber right here. I have split it right here, just a little bit. And I mean a very tiny little bit. And that is from coming down and hitting wood or being driven down into the block that I am batoning, uh, my base block, my anvil block that I'm batoning through. It's, uh, you know, it's minor. I don't know if I can even show you that, the minorness of that. And again, this has been used a lot. So let me tell you a quick story about this because uh, I think it's quite relevant. The sheath I have, which I'll reach and grab right now, this is the sheath I carried in. Um, I don't carry this on my belt, and we'll talk more about that, but this is not the original sheath. This is a sheath made from PVC, and if you're interested how I made this, I have a video on making knives. She's from PVC, and that's what this is. When I bought this, I opted not to get the leather sheath, just to save money for, if, for no other reason. It's just to save money, but what it comes with is a plastic liner that would be used in a leather sheath, but it's just a protector more than anything else. And the reason I opted not, not just to save the money, what well, was because I didn't think I'd be wearing this in my belt, and I don't. It is just too big. I could wear it on my belt, but honestly, this is either inside of my pack or down in one of the side pockets or strapped to the outside where I can get at it whenever I get to the location that I'm going to be processing wood. I could carry it, 
it's just, it's heavy, to be honest. I mean, that's a heavy knife to be carried around your waist. Maybe you don't mind, but I didn't want to. So what happened to the original plastic sheath that came with this? Well, I had it out this summer when I was camping at Kujbaquak National Park, as I mentioned, and my daughter and her partner joined us and they had the site across from us and they had bought some firewood and I had axed it down or cut it down with an ax to a certain size. And I loaned them my scrama to baton down and my uh, daughter and I has come out in the woods quite a few times so she has some skill and knows what she's doing and I left it with them. Uh, <laughs> they left it in the plastic sheaf on the back of the metal fireplace that you are required to burn your wood in there at the park and when I went over to see them the next day here was this thing completely encased in a melted glob of plastic stuck to the back of the fireplace and I was sure not only was the sheaf ruined or the, the, the carrier for it ruined but it had to have ruined the temper in the knife right I mean it couldn't be exposed to heat like the fire they had and not be well, it turns out with some effort, I got the sheath off and uh, I, there was only one way to know is to test it. I thought there might be some discoloration showing tempering changes, you know, where it goes to a yellow and even a purple blue, depending on, on the heat exposed to. But I just literally hammered this with a piece of wood on into another piece of hardwood as often and as cross grain and every tip down, you name it, I did and uh, no damage. No damage, no heat treat loss or anything else. There is still some plastic stuck to the outside of the blade that I'd have to use sandpaper to get off. But other than that, the, the tool has withstood some tremendous abuse for sure. One other use that I've put this to, which to I've used it for, which I think is perfectly legitimate for a, a knife like this, is digging and prying. No, I don't mean digging in the ground, but digging in logs. So there is a down pine tree not too far away from here. Here, and it's been down for many years and I've been searching it for fat wood primarily in the stump at ground level but also in the knots where the branches come out of it and I've used this for literally just jamming in and prying and jamming in and prying uh, to get at the fat wood with no damage and I don't hesitate to do it because I know this knife will take that abuse. Yeah okay so I think I have talked long enough about this knife and what it is capable of. Uh, what are some of the pros and cons about this thing? I think that primarily it is an indestructible tool that you will not hesitate to use in the roughest way. Now I'm not suggesting for a moment that you should try and uh, dismantle a vehicle or anything else with this reasonable use of this for its intended purposes, which is wood processing, I don't think it's possible to damage this knife. So it's, that's the, the primary pro. Uh, the primary con is its weight. It is heavy if you want to carry this on your belt. But if you're not considering carrying something like this on your belt, then uh, you know, the weight is not bad. It's about the same weight as a hatchet, in fact. I think I did some comparisons at one point, and this comes in very close to, well, a 650 gram hatchet and this would come in pretty close when you think about it. Okay, I opted not to give demonstrations of this tool in use today because I knew I had a lot to say about it and I have used this so extensively over the last three and a half years that it has shown up in a great number of videos. If you want to see some initial use of this knife, have a look at the video I did back in March or April of 2018, and you'll see me using this for the very first time. Uh, not especially skilled with it, because again, it was the very first time. Uh, yeah, so that's what I want to say about the Traver Scrama from Vrostalika. If you have any questions about this tool, then please put them in the comments section below. If you have any comments, perhaps you own one and your experiences with this tool, put those in the comments section below. I will, of course, be putting all the specifications for the Traver Scrama in the show notes or video description underneath, as well as the link to where you can purchase this from Vrostalika with or without the leather sheath, I think this is a tool that you would be happy to have, happy to use, and you'll, like me, likely turn to more often than not for processing wood. Okay, that's all I have to say for this tool and for this video, so get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.